Okay, just to remind you who we are, that's the stake president. <laughs> he made you sing that twice. <laughs> Probably should have gone three times. And this is me. Uh, I'm, I'm not the stake president, but I'm the executive director of the B.H. Roberts Foundation, and uh, this is my full-time job. So I study controversial topics in church history using primary source data, and I've been doing this for several years now. Okay, uh, we're at the third lecture here, the biggest two problems, the two biggest problems in church history, part two. Okay, so this is welcome. And we've got another food metaphor. <laughs> Just to remind you. Um, who wasn't here last week? Raise your hand if you weren't here that. Okay, all right, some new folks. Um, raise your hand if you weren't here the first week. Okay, all right. It's okay, you'll catch up. Um, now, this is made of wheat. You gotta use wheat to make the bun, lettuce. Iceberg lettuce uh, gets a bad rap, I think. It's, I, you know, they say it's not nutritious at all. I, I like it, it's crunchy. Uh, cows, you need that to make the cheese. Tomatoes, mmm. But look, that's disgusting. And that's the rest of the sandwich, okay? So metaphorically speaking, um, this is the gospel of Jesus Christ, okay? It's delicious, it's good for you. When you dig into how it's made, there's some gross stuff sometimes. Um, a, a fellow was talking to me uh, before the meeting here. He said, oh, I grew up on a ranch and we know how all the gross stuff's made. And I'm glad I didn't. I'm, I grew up in a city. We don't want to know these things. Um, but this is to remind you that, that it's okay not to know. You don't have to know how things are made, but if it's an interest, interesting thing for you, then you know that's what we're doing here tonight. Okay, so uh, this is a priesthood and temple restrictions for black saints, what we know, what we don't know, and how to be okay with this. Uh, caveat, um, I'm white. <laughs> and I don't want to speak for President McConkey, but I'm pretty sure he's a white guy too. Uh, technically, I'm actually a second-generation ge uh, Mexican-American. I don't know if that counts for anything, but I'm, I'll take the white label, okay? So what that means is, is that uh, we're, we're going to be speaking from our perspective. L last week, we talked about polygamy, and, and guess what? I'm monogamous. Um, I'm also a man, right? Uh, next week, we're going to be talking about sexual minorities in the church. Uh, we, we don't need representation to learn, but you can get unique and special and sacred perspectives from people that have had lived experiences. But I just wanted to recognize that this is mine. So you're going to hear this through my filter. Okay? Uh, okay. This is a reminder the past is a, a foreign country. Okay? And people do different things there. This, this couple here, this black couple with a dog, that they look, don't they look like just like a, a Gen Z couple? Because they all, they all get little dogs instead of kids now. <laughs> so you might think, hey, yeah, that's, they're like us. You know, I, maybe in some ways. Um, these folks on the right, actually every single one of those people is considered black. Um, even though those kids look pretty white. They had enough, uh, quote, Negro blood in them that they were considered black. And they were actually enslaved. This photograph was used to raise money, because they're reading books, to raise money after the Civil War for, uh, for people in the South. But again, this, that makes no sense to us, right? But again, the, the past is a different country, okay? So that's really important uh, that you understand that. Uh, okay. Um, we're going to start with an official statement from the church, all right? Uh, the church disavows the theories advanced in the past that black skin is a divine uh, disfavor, a sign of divine disfavor or curse, or that it reflects unrighteous actions in a premortal life, that mixed race marriages are a sin, or that blacks or people of any other race or ethnicity are inferior in any way to anyone else. Church leaders today uh, unequivocally condemn all racism past, present, in any form. So the church is not okay with racism, is the big takeaway here. Um, 
Now we're going to talk about historical context, because we're talking about uh, history, so we're going to get a little context. I'm going to just rip the Band-Aid off and start with this quote. I will say then that I am not, nor ever have been, in favor of bringing about in any way the social and political equality of the white and black races. I am not, nor ever have been, in favor of making voters or jurors of Negroes, nor of qualifying them to hold office, nor to intermarry with white people. And I will say there is a physical difference between the white and black races, which I believe will forever forbid the two races living together on terms of social and political equality, and therefore must be in a position, uh, there, there must be the position of superior and inferior, and I am in a favor of having the superior position assigned to the white race. That's a pretty bigoted statement, and that's really hard to forgive someone that said that. But uh, Lincoln said that, not Brigham Young. <laughs> Remember, the past is a different country. You weren't there. The, the, the understanding we have of what that was like back then is is, is we, we just don't get it. This is to remind you that President Lincoln said all this. He was on record saying this, yet he is the one that works tirelessly to emancipate the slaves. How does that work? How can we make that make sense? This is an illustration of what our challenge is today as people living in the 21st century trying to understand what was going on in the 19th century, okay? Let's see what Lincoln actually said. They are now wasting away the black race by thousands. Many of the blacks are treated worse than we treat our dumb brutes. And men will be called the judgment for the way they have treated the Negro, and they will receive the condemnation. God has created of one blood all the nations and kingdoms of men that dwell upon all the face of the earth, black, white, copper colored, or whatever their color, customs or religion, they have all sprung from the same origin. The blood of all is from the same element. This is the last time I'm going to lie to you, but that's actually Brigham Young. <laughs> Hopefully this reoriented your mind a little bit to understand how complicated things were in the 19th century when it came to race, okay? All right, uh, now let's talk about general racism. There's lots of different types of racism. Paternal racism is a particular type. This is the emancipation statue that was put up in, uh, I think it was 1879. Um, and uh, it, it's it, it actually just recently, a couple years ago, there's been efforts to tear this down. Because it is paternally racist, it shows uh, a, a, an enslaved person or formerly enslaved person down on their knees with no clothes and a white savior above him, right? That is a type of paternal racism that in the 19th century, they're like, hey, this is okay, right? Now we're like, you know, that racism still counts, that paternal type of racism. Uh, there's also scientific racism. This played a role in the 19th century. Josiah Knott was an anthropologist uh, from the South. He wrote a number of books and pamphlets and basically said, hey, look, um, if we have white people and black people marry and have children, they'll produce infertile children. And if they're infertile, eventually the entire human race will be wiped out. So we cannot allow this to happen. And this was an, an accepted scientific theory at the time. This may explain some of Brigham Young's uh, caution, I guess, against uh, mixed race marriages. Um, where he would use rhetoric saying, oh, it's the death to us all if we allow this. But this was a common belief at the time. Uh, there's also violent racism. Horrible, horrible, hate-filled violent racism. <clears throat> now, the church is guilty of paternal racism. The, the church may be even guilty of scientific racism. We are not guilty of violent racism. That is not part of us as an institution. Um, I don't know if this is, uh, uh, counts for much, but I think it counts for something. Also speaking of 19th century racism, 
William Lloyd Garrison was an abolitionist. Today, we would call him an anti-Semite and a racist. John Brown, we would call him a child abuser, a terrorist, a murderer, and a racist. Notice how I didn't put murder in quotes, because I, I, well, he was a murderer. But even Harriet Beecher Stowe, who wrote Uncle Tom's Cabin, we would consider things she said as racist. But these were the heroes of the 19th century, as far as black emancipation went. Again, a complicated history. All of these people throughout time, the last several thousand years, every single one of these people would be guilty of racism, sexism, xenophobia, ableism, classism. But, you know, was anyone good before the 20th century? I mean, yeah, of course, of course. Judging the past by the present is uh, doing a disservice to both, okay? So hopefully I beat this dead horse dead enough, but it's really, really important we contextualize this stuff. We're incredibly privileged to live in the 21st century, incredibly privileged. We have the, the, the most human knowledge at our fingertips that, in history and a, a fantastic perspective. Now that's also a challenge for us because the perspective we've, we are fed is at the top of that iceberg. If you recall the first lecture, we only get what we're served. It's really hard to dig in and see what else is there. Okay, so why is this the biggest, one of the biggest problems in church history? Um, this is the root of it, okay? The origin of the priesthood and temple restriction for black saints speaks to the fundamental question of trusting prophets of God to implement policy based on received revelation, which has broad implications about current policies in the church. This is why this is one of the hardest problems in church history. If it wasn't inspired, how do we trust the prophets? If it was inspired, how do we square this with our understanding of God? Now, if you recall, we are not going to answer all your questions. We cannot, we do not know the answers to all your questions. So do not be disappointed if at, at the end of this uh, hour and a half, you're like, gee, I, I, I learned a few new things, but I didn't get my, my questions answered. It's not because we're holding back, <laughs> okay? These are hard, hard problems. Uh, recently, the B.H. Roberts Foundation did uh, the largest uh, a representative survey of Latter-day Saints uh, that's ever been done. Um, and a question was asked, the priesthood and temple restriction against black members was uninspired and was implemented and maintained primarily because of racism. Do you agree or disagree? It was split in thirds with yes, I agree, no, I disagree, or I'm neutral. I would imagine if I took the survey here, it would be similar. Now the church's position is pretty neutral, right? I mean, they just, they're not touching this. They're like, racism is bad. Theories you've heard in the past, they're, we're not about that stuff. Let's focus on loving now. That's the position they'll take. Historically speaking, they'll say, well, this is what happened. We're not going to explain it, but we're just gonna tell you the facts, okay? I'll do the same thing today. I'll tell you the facts, but I, I don't think I'm gonna sway you where you are on here, and I don't think the church is interested, frankly, in doing that. The only thing they care about is you loving each other and forgiving each other and looking forward and not backwards, okay? All right, let me remind you, our, our friend Joseph Smith, he's an undocumented guy, he didn't write much about plural marriage. Nearly everything we have on plural marriages from other sources other than Joseph Smith. Heavenly Mother, guess what? We don't have anything on Heavenly Mother that Joseph Smith taught. It's all secondhand 10, 20, 30, 40 years later. And Black Saints and the Priesthood. We don't really have anything on this topic from Joseph either. It was very frustrating. Maybe it was a blessing that there are certain topics he just didn't record. Now, we still have information about his opinions about black saints, uh, on slavery, and different topics that are related, but on the topic of priesthood ordination, we, we have nothing firsthand from him. 
we start at the beginning here in 1829, Joseph translates in 2 Nephi, and it says, the Lord denieth none that come unto him black and white, bond and free, male and female, and all are alike unto God. So that's kind of one of the first things Joseph uh, has revealed to him in the restoration. However, nearly the next thing he does is receive a revelation from Moses that says, and they were a mixture of all the seed of Adam, save it were the seed of Cain, for the seed of Cain were black and had not place among them. So we have these two revelations in the earliest part of the church. What's he supposed to do with that? It's hard. Now, to save time, I'm not going to go through every single thing Joseph ever said about black saints and the priesthood, um, but I'm going to give you some highlights. You can, there's probably no more than two dozen things we have on record where he's even referring to either of these, these things, and, and none specifically together. Okay, Joseph in the 1836 Minute Book said, uh, th this is a rule book for the Kirtland Temple. By the way, they, they made a rule book. They said, okay, no man shall be interrupted who is appointed to speak by the permission of the church by any display of ill manners or ill breeding from bond or free black or white believer or unbeliever. The implication is, is that black people would be in the temple here with us. Because how can they have this apply to them if they weren't there? So this is interesting data about the Kirtland Temple. He expected, and there were black saints at this time. In 1840, he said, persons of all languages and of every tongue and of every color who shall with us worship the Lord of hosts in this holy temple. So this is referring uh, to the temple they were building in Nauvoo. And he specifically says every color. Now, some people say, well, they worship, they had church services there. The actual temple ceremonies were somewhere else in the temple. We don't, we don't know. But in 1843, he said, black people have souls and are subjects of salvation. Well, no kidding, but this was not an obvious statement to make in the 19th century. Uh, Protestants and Catholics um, had segregated congregations. I incredible amounts of racism going on in those organizations as well. And so for him to proclaim that, that's, that's fascinating. That's fascinating for the time. 1844, in a public sermon, he said, in regards to the law of the priesthood, there should be a place where all nations shall come up from time to time to receive their endowments. All nations, including the African nations. Okay, so these are all statements from Joseph Smith that are related to this topic. He also had some other statements. These are more challenging. In 1836, referring to African slaves, he said, the curse is not yet taken off from the sons of Canaan. In 1842, he said, black people are the sons of Cain. In 1842, in the book of Abraham, he said, descendants of Ham are cursed pertaining to the priesthood, and that he was of the lineage by which he could not have the right of the priesthood. And then, this is something that Joseph Smith didn't say, but an omission. From 1839 to 1846, we had about 20 uh, black people living in Nauvoo. About half of them were men. Not a single one uh, was ordained or went through the Nauvoo Temple. We don't know why. That's just what the records show. So, um, and to further complicate things, we have testimonies from general authorities, contemporary with Joseph Smith, who said Joseph taught the black saints could not have the priesthood. But these recollections are from many decades later, and some of them are contradicted by other pieces of data. Some of these men were sympathetic. Some of them owned slaves. It's hard to interpret history. And like we've talked about, when you have something that says, well, this is a fact. Well, maybe. We're not sure if this is true, their testimonies. You can look them up. You can see what they said. They all tell stories about, well, Joseph, we had this conversation. This is what he said to me. But people interpret that 30% uncertainty different. Again, that's an arbitrary number, 30 here. Paul Reeve is like, that. all the, those four general authorities were all wrong. They, they are grossly mistaken, or they're fabricating their memories. Ron K. Esplin, he's the manager of the Joseph Smith Papers Project, he's like, no, actually, yeah, I'm pretty sure Joseph taught this. The historical evidence says so. These people don't agree. They're both faithful members of the church. They're both historians. 
They disagree. By now in the lecture series, this should not surprise you at all. Okay? Now, let's shift gears to uh, Missouri. If you recall, we had Kirtland and Missouri in the 1830s. The church was really in two places at the same time. <clears throat> Missouri had a problem. Missouri had a law that did not allow free blacks in the state. They, didn't, they were a slave state, and they didn't want free blacks in the, slave, uh, in, in the state. But the church had no problem with free blacks joining the church. And Missouri was a gathering place. <laughs> so you see there's a conflict. So W.W. W. Phelps published something in the Morning Star in July of 1833. He said, so long as we have no special rule in the church as to people of color, let prudence guide and waltz they as well as we are in the hands of a merciful God, we say, shun every appearance of evil. As to slaves, we have nothing to say. In connection with the wonderful events of this age, much is doing towards abolishing slavery and colonizing the blacks in Africa. So in that, the translation is basically like, we don't really want to talk about slavery, but a lot of neat things are happening under the hands of God, and maybe it'll be abolished. Maybe we will send black people back to Africa. Who knows? Well, this didn't stand for the Missourians. They're like, wow, you guys, you, you Mormons are abolitionists. Uh, within three days, a retraction was published where we basically said, with extreme regret, the article entitled Free People of Color in the last number of the star has been misunderstood. Our intention was not only to stop free people of color from emigrating to the state, but to prevent them from being admitted as members of the church, we are opposed to have free people of color admitted into the state. Now, Joseph didn't write this. This was Phelps. Joseph was in Kirtland. So we don't know how much influence he had over this. This is just Phelps swinging uh, you know, for the fences here, trying to get, get right with Missouri and just having a, a bad time out of it. Um, and just a few days later, the Missourians tore down the printing press where this was uh, printed. And then a few days after that, uh, they tarred and feathered uh, the bishop and uh, another member of the church. This event actually, has anyone been to uh, the Missouri Capitol building? There are huge murals in that building of Mormons getting their homes burned, helping black people, and getting tarred and feathered. And that's because at the time, the Mormons were the friends of the slaves. And the Capitol building's like, yeah, look, we're, we're ready to come to terms and admit that we were wrong. And the Mormons were doing the right thing. And we're really sorry we were horrible to you guys. That's nice to get a little acknowledgement that we were friends to black people in Missouri at the time. Again, complicated history. Because you're saying, wow, they got tarred and feathered because they showed empathy and understanding towards black people. How, how does a policy come out of that that seems horrifically racist. Confusing times. Were there black saints ordained in the time of Joseph? Well, let's go through the handful of black people we know about. We don't know about very many of them. Black Peter was the first uh, member of the church who was black that we know of. He was an African-American, former enslaved person. Joined the church sometime in 1830, 1831. The Painesville Gazette said, a Negro who is a chief man among them is said to have jumped 25 feet down a bank into the top of a treetop without injury. There, there's actually several articles written about this guy, Black Pete, who did sort of amazing feats. He was apparently very enthusiastic. Um, he was with the Morley Farm and the group of the saints uh, there in Ohio. Uh, but we don't know much other than he existed and he was amongst the saints. So there's no data indicating that he received the priesthood. However, Elijah Abel was ordained in 1836. We have his ordination certificate. It is signed by Joseph Smith. We have the original. Uh, he was an octoroon. He was one-eighth black, so he's 12% black. He was considered black. An eighth was enough to do that. He was ordained an elder. Uh, he received Washington anointings in the Kirtland Temple. He was ordained to 70. He served uh, a mission to Canada as well as other uh, missions in the church. So he was, he was part of the leadership. In fact, he, he presided over an excommunication of some white members for apostasy. He, he, he had a lot of adventures, and he was close with Joseph Smith. Now, we look at this and say, well, okay, this is it. This is the nail in the coffin. 
for this idea of Joseph Smith ordaining black people? Well, John Taylor, uh, years later, had a meeting about Elijah Abel because they weren't sure what to do with him. President Taylor said it seemed that in uh, his case, it was probably like many other things done in the early days of the church. What had been done through the lack of knowledge that was not altogether correct in detail was allowed to remain. He thought that probably it was so in Brother Abel's case, that he, having been ordained before the word of the Lord was fully understood, it was allowed to remain. Now, this is from Lester Bush's papers. Who, he was a historian uh, because the church won't allow us access to the originals. So this is the second best thing we have is um, this idea that John Taylor, at this time a prophet, saying, what do we do with Elijah Abel? And this was his interpretation. Joseph T. Ball, he uh, was a black man that lived in Boston. He was ordained an elder in 1838. He served a mission with, in New England with Wilford Woodruff. He was a branch president of Boston. Ultimately, he was accused of financial and proprietary and teaching spiritual wife doctrine. He left the church before he was excommunicated. Um, his, the thing is, though, he was white. Uh, he passed as white. It was a secret that he was black. His father was from Jamaica, um, was an, actually part of a, a black society in New England. But Joseph Ball looked white and never told anyone about his ancestry. In fact, the census in 1820 and 1830 list him as white. His, the entire rest of his life, he is listed in white, as white in all the census. When Wilford Woodruff served a mission with him in his journals, he didn't say, I am with an, a, a Negro elder. That's what he would have said. He's just like, yeah, it's Elder Ball. So sometimes you'll, and by the way, uh, this particular topic, race and the priesthood, um, I have seen more historical inaccuracies published on the internet about this than any other topic I have ever studied, which is crummy. But this is the fact of the matter. People get very passionate about this, and, 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 and history is hard. But anyway, Joseph Ball, um, technically black, but he was a white guy. Q. Walker Lewis, he was ordained, we think, in 1843. He was a barber from Massachusetts. He was a civil rights activist and an abolitionist. He was ordained by William Smith. That's the prophet's brother, William Smith. Uh, Brigham Young in 1847 referred to him as one of our best elders. So this is, this is sort of a, um, an important piece of data that comes up pretty much in every essay about black saints uh, in the priesthood in Joseph Smith's time. This is actually very complicated. And I'll tell you why. is because William Smith, the, the, the brother of Joseph, remind you who he is. He, he hefted the gold plates in 1829. In 1835, he beat up Joseph until he was un unable to sit down or rise up without help. He was a very violent man. In 1835, he ordained an apostle, contrary to our feelings and judgment and to our deep mortification ever since. That's what the other apostles said about him. <laughs> Joseph said, look, do me a favor. I need William to be an apostle to save his soul. Um, in 1839, he was disfellowshipped and then reinstated the same year. In 1845, disfellowshipped went and then excommunicated. He was excommunicated because he performed unauthorized ordinances, financial and proprietary and teacher and spiritual wife doctrine. Um, he also later wrote, uh, by what authority have we, by what authority have we the right to say that a colored man has no right to be ordained to all the powers of the priesthood? So, he was passionate about ordaining black people to the church, and he did so in 1843. We don't have a record of it. It was in Boston. Was it authorized by Joseph and headquarters? We, we just don't know. We don't know. We know Brigham Young was aware of it. He said, well, yeah, we know, you know Walker Lewis. He's an elder. Was it something that was OK that William did? I, we don't know, right? Uh, William Appleby knew and didn't like it. <laughs> Uh, in this branch, he visited Boston. He, he was a, uh, a branch president in uh, New Jersey. He also uh, was eventually the uh, uh, mission president of the Eastern States Mission. He said, in this branch, there is a colored brother, an elder ordained by Elder uh, William Smith while he was a member of the church, contrary to the order of the church and the law of the priesthood, as the descendants of Ham are not entitled to that privilege. So in 1847, uh, by then, we have someone who says, well, wait, this isn't OK that he was ordained in 1843. It's against the rules. Was he referring to an actual rule that was around in the time of Joseph? We don't know. We don't know. Let's talk about after Joseph Smith. Less than a year after Joseph Smith is killed, 
John Taylor says black people are the descendants of Ham and have black skin, which has ever been a curse and are apostates of the Holy Priesthood. And then in 1847, there was a really important meeting. Again, if you do research on this topic, this comes up all the time. Uh, Brigham says, at sundown, sundown, this is in winter's quarters, by the way. Uh, at sundown, I met the brethren of the 12. So the, all the apostles are there. And others, also William McCary, the Indian Negro, and his wife at the office. McCary made a rambling statement, claiming to be Adam, the Ancient of Days, and exhibited himself in an Indian costume. He also claimed to have an odd rib, which he had discovered in his wife. Now, <laughs> I know it seems silly, but this is one of the strangest meetings that have, has ever been recorded in church history. Okay, uh, this is William McCary. That's a, an art artistic depiction of, uh, we don't actually have a photograph of him, but he, he was a black man that um, adopted uh, a persona from the Choctaw Nation. So he said, I, I am, I'm from the Choctaw Nation. But he, he was just a black guy. He, he was formerly a slave. Um, he was also a musician. He was really talented with singing and, and, and playing instruments. Uh, he married a white woman in Nauvoo who presented as a Delaware Indian. After this young woman said, well, I want to be an Indian too, so I'm going to be a Delaware Indian. <laughs> so here they were, this Indian couple, mixed race Indian couple, that uh, were uh, musicians. Um, they formed a church. They had about 60 people that would follow them around and he would preach to them. But eventually it, it disbanded. He claimed to be Adam, or a prophet of some sort. Uh, he met with Brigham Young and complained about racism and had him examine his ribs. The meeting notes are very strange. Uh, you can read them. We have them documented. And, and, but the reason this is important is because the topic was, I'm a black man, and I'm complaining about racism to the prophet and the 12. And we're going to talk about this. And that's a very rare meeting in 1847, any time in the 19th century. That's why this is really important. Brigham said, we don't care about the color. It's nothing to do with blood, for of one blood has God made all flesh. So and this is also where he brings up, Brigham Young brings up Q. Walker Lewis as being one of the best elders uh, out in Massachusetts. So how do you interpret what's going on here? Uh, oh, by the way, he also performed ceilings where he'd had sex with women. That, was, that got him in trouble. Here's, you know, so he was excommunicated. But um, anyway, but, but the meeting, uh, it was a very strange meeting. And you can interpret it as an opportunity for, uh, to, to have insight into the 12 and Brigham Young's thinking about black saints and the priesthood. Or you can think of it as, oh my gosh, there's a crazy person here. How do I placate, placate them to get them out of here? And, and again, we weren't there. We don't know. It was a very strange meeting. The minutes are strange. Everything about this is strange. But it's, it's the data we have, OK? Uh, shortly afterwards, Parley P. Pratt said, people want to follow this black man who have got the blood of Ham in which the uh, lineage was cursed as regards to the priesthood. They can go follow him. Now, this is the first time that Abraham, it's scripture, is paraphrased as relating to some relationship between black men in the 19th century and a priesthood man. Again, we, we don't have any other context. We have these little fragments from notes. Uh, a couple years later, Lorenzo Snow, they were having a, a, a meeting, a leadership meeting. He says, Lorenzo Snow presented the case of the African race for a chance of redemption and un unlocked the door to him. He said, Brigham, let's talk about black people. When are we going to give them the priesthood? And Brigham said, we can't do that yet. Someday, but not now. And he went, OK. So that was happening in 1949. Some people interpret this as uh, the earliest point was sometime in 47 or 49 when the restriction was put in place. Other people interpret it as, well, it's been in place since Joseph's time. And he just said, well, how about we just bring this up? They didn't have a big discussion about it. It was a short, relatively short discussion because they already knew the issues, apparently. At least that's one way to read it. Now, 1852, this is the big date everyone brings up. Brigham Young says, if there was never a prophet or apostle of Jesus Christ spoken before, I tell you, this people that are commonly called Negroes are the children of old Cain. I know they are. I know that they cannot bear rule in the priesthood. That time will come when black saints will have the privilege of all we have the privilege of and more. So he said, at some point they will, but right now they can't. So this is a perfect, the, the first public declaration. 
So when people put a date on when did the restriction get put in place, it's 1852 is typically uh, that date because of this speech to the Utah legislation. Okay, we're skipping a ton of stuff. I'm skipping a ton of stuff. Slavery in Utah, baptisms for the dead. Interesting enough, Brigham Young let a whole bunch of black saints do baptisms for the dead just for a weekend. It's a strange thing. Uh, there's a Jane Manning James, fantastic, interesting story about her petitioning uh, to have her temple blessings. The petition of Elijah Abel, the John Taylor Council, there's so much more. We can't cover it, okay? I'm going to shift to modern, uh, the, the modern topic of black saints in the priesthood. Okay, and this is going to be brief. This is also very brief, trying to cram 70 years into a couple of slides. So I'm just taking little bits of pieces here. Joseph F. Smith was the prophet until 1918. He said, and this is kind of insulting, but this is, again, this is the best we got. I have seen many Polish gentlemen in my life who have been unfortunate enough not to be white. That is, their, that is in their skin. But in their hearts and in their manners, in their courtesy and conduct, they were far superior to many of their boasting white brothers. Again, pretty racist. But this is him trying to be nice, I guess, right? The point is, is that, well, there's a lot of points here. One is, there weren't a whole lot of black members of the church back then, okay? But here he's trying to say, look, don't be so proud that you're white. Look at your, inside your hearts. Heber J. Grant. He said, until the Lord gives us revelation regarding the matter, we shall have to maintain the policy of the church. So the policy was, in, in his time, he said, look, there is a policy. We're not budging there. George Albert Smith, uh, he said, Negroes are not entitled to full blessings of the gospel. He said, from the days of the prophet Joseph until now. That's what, in his mind, how he felt about it. David O. McKay, he said, we are assured the time will come when the Negro will receive every blessing to which he is entitled, including the priesthood. From now on, here in Africa, you may treat people just the same as we treat them in South Carolina or Washington or New York or Salt Lake City. He enacted a new rule before you had to trace genealogy, saying, oh, I, I'm, I'm not black. But he said, you know what? We're doing some work in South Africa. We're starting to do work in Brazil. That's untenable. They look like white people, they're white people. They look like black people, they're black people. And that might not sound, may not sound like progress, but it was progress. It was a lot of progress. Joseph Fielding Smith, Eugene England, uh, was a scholar at BYU, and he tracked down uh, Joseph Fielding Smith and said, we need to talk about this. Ultimately, and he recorded the conversation, so this is from Eugene England's perspective. He basically just said, Joseph Fielding Smith said, look, this is what I was taught. You don't have to believe Negroes are denied the priesthood because of the pre-existence. I've always assumed that because that's what I was taught, and it made sense. But you don't have to be in good standing because it's definitely not in the scriptures. And I've received no revelation on the matter. Okay, for what it's worth. Harold B. Lee, if uh, you will remain true and faithful to the church, the time will come when the policy of the church will change. And then Spencer W. Kimball. Now, President McConkie is going to talk about him, so I'm going to skip him. This is when he was a missionary in the 1920s. Okay, we're skipping a lot of historical stuff in the modern times, too. Love Branch in South Africa, fascinating, inspiring story. If you not, don't know about the Love Branch, look that up. Official statements for the First Presidency, there were a few. Missionary discussions on race in Brazil, Patriarchal Blessing, Lester Bush, Sao Paulo, Brazil Temple, the Genesis Group, so much more. I mean, it's, it's, there's, especially in the modern day, there's a lot more records to look through. We're going to review some questions here real quick to make sure you guys understand the basics. Do ancient texts indicate that Cain or Ham were black? Well, some of them do, but most do not. Okay? Because some people are like, well, what do the ancient scriptures say? Well, some say Cain had a black face and some don't. The oldest ones don't. They say his countenance fell. But there are many ancient ones that say, well, it was black as coal. You know? So there's not a lot of light and knowledge from the ancient texts in this regard. Did the church ever segregate uh, congregations? No, not as a policy. It's actually pretty unique. Most churches, or a lot of churches, did. Um, there are some exceptions in apartheid in South Africa. There were legal requirements. Um, there are a couple of sad stories where a family that was black in maybe Tennessee or Georgia was discriminated against, but this was never a policy of the church. 
Did Joseph Smith ever document any type of priesthood or temple restriction for black saints? No, he didn't. We only have secondhand reports. How many black people were ordained in Joseph Smith's time? Two-ish. Okay. One is Elijah Abel that we are pretty 100% certain that was legit because, again, Joseph Smith signed that certificate. The other one, uh, Walker Lewis, uh, yeah, he was ordained. We're not sure if that was an okay thing that happened or not, but so that's why we say two-ish. Uh, was the priesthood ban policy inspired by God? Well, Brigham implied that it was. Past apostles and prophets have taught that it was, and the current position of the church is neutral on this question. Has the church ever apologized for the priesthood and temple ban? No. Um, an apology might imply things which the church does not want to imply. I'm not saying this will never happen. I'm just saying if, if it does, it's going to create a lot of drama because a lot of people will read into it in ways that maybe they should, maybe they shouldn't, I don't know, but they haven't. So just FYI. Uh, was the ban lifted because of social pressure? Possibly. I'm not going to go into this, but... Sports teams, if you were alive back then, if you recall, sports teams boycotted BYU in the late 60s, early 70s because of the policy. And also the IRS threatened to revoke tax exempt status on schools based on racial policy. There was pressure, of course, the, the ban, uh, the restriction wasn't removed till years later. Um, President Kimball said the conferring of the priesthood and decline, declining to give the priesthood is not a matter of my choice nor of President McKay's, it is the Lord's program. When the Lord is ready to relax the restriction, it will come whether there is pressure or not. Okay, miscellaneous questions, and then we'll turn it over to President McConkey. Um, was the Ku Klux Klan ever established in Utah? No, not successfully. They tried, but Heber J. Grant didn't like them, and the church didn't like them. So they were really unable to get a foothold here in the early party, part of the 20th century. That makes me really happy. I'd be super sad if this was different. But... The Klan was clearly a hate group. The church is not about hate. And they're like, we don't want you here. Uh, did the church support civil rights? Mostly-ish. We'll say yes, mostly-ish. Officially, October 6, 1963, and then again in 1969, the First Presidency issued statements in support of full civil rights for all citizens. The 69 statement also said the priesthood ban was put in place for reasons we believe are known to God but which he has not made fully known to man. So that's interesting. Now, there are certain apostles and prophets and general authorities. I just say there are general authorities in the church that were not fans of civil rights movement for lots of reasons. But officially speaking, these are the official declarations from the church on the matter. Were there slaves in Utah? Yeah, there were. Uh, before the Emancipation Proclamation, at any given year, there was about 30 slaves in the state, roughly. Now, slavery was different in Utah. It was still slavery. But the rules for slavery in Utah were more like northern state rules, not southern state rules. Brigham Young hated southern chattel slavery. He thought it was disgusting and wrong. But he had a belief that black people needed to serve. So the laws in Utah were, well, you, you, you can bring your slaves from the south, but guess what? If they have kids, those kids aren't slaves. You, they can be indentured servants until they're adults, but they're, they are not permanent slaves. You can't break families up. You cannot sell slaves without their permission. You have to educate slaves. They have to be educated. I think it was 18 months. They needed at least 18 months of education. Uh, they had laws against uh, uh, being sexually involved with slaves. If you do that, they get taken away from you. So slavery in Utah was still slavery, but... As written, it would be gone within a generation. It was not something that would last. So an optimistic view is Brigham was sort of easing this to freedom. A pessimistic view is, well, dang it, it was slavery, and, and, and that's that. So for what it's worth. Uh, how were black people treated in Utah after the emancipation? The Mormons treated the colored people well. This is what Booker T. Washington said. He uh, came to visit Utah for a couple days. He walked around and said, you know what? This isn't so bad for black people. He wrote up an article about it. Samuel and Amanda Chambers, you may have heard about them. Uh, they were relatively wealthy members of the church here in Mill Creek. They had a big farm, big farm. Um, in fact, he was 
it, they encouraged Samuel to run for uh, state legis legislator. He, he didn't want anything to uh, do with politics. He was a very smart man. Um, but yeah, they, I mean, you could be very successful and, 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 uh, and be black in Utah. It was, it was not a bad place to be at the time. Okay, we're the home stretch here. Let me share this with you. Here are your two options. I'm gonna walk you through your options, all right? Option one, church leaders implemented the restriction because of racist traditions, and there was no authentic revelation or doctrine to justify it. It's kind of your first option. Your second option is, the restriction was inspired by God as a temporary practice for some wise purpose. Now, maybe there's options in between, but these are the two primary options that I'm presenting to you. Now, uh, <clears throat> one of the implications of option one, we'll walk through option one, and then we'll walk through option two. God was not involved in the implementation, but he did correct it in 78. So that's one of your options. If you go with option one, you say, well, I believe that. Or you can say God was not involved in the implementation or the removal of the restriction. The whole thing was man-made. He had nothing to do with any of this. Again, you, you get to choose, right? You get to choose. Now, what this means is the restriction was not from God. God allowed his church to maintain this erroneous policy for over a century. God allows prophets to maintain unjust practices and teach erroneous principles to his people. Those are the implications of option one. So you might look at option one and say, yeah, that sounds right to me. That, that resonates with me. And you are totally allowed to do that. That's an okay thing. Patrick Mason, he's from the History Department of Utah State. He believes in option one. I treat the priesthood ban as a sin, as Brigham Young making a mistake, beyond a mistake, a sin, a really consequential sin. So if you're a fan of Patrick Mason, you're in good company right, with option one. Or Darius Gray, he was uh, a member of the Genesis group, one of the official, the official black group that the church put together in the 70s. The brethren are working on it, trying to undo that scaffolding that was used to justify a policy that was never of God, but thought to have been of God and taught as though it were of God. Again, if you're an option one guy, you've got, you've got a friend, okay? Also, there's a book, Race and the Priesthood. Let's talk about Race and the Priesthood by Paul Reeve. Uh, this published by Deseret Book. It basically says Joseph Smith had no priesthood or temple restriction from blacks. It says Brigham Young, because of racism, placed restriction on blacks, and God allowed this restriction to stay in place until 78. So again, if you are option one, read this book and believe everything in it and just be like, I feel good. This is what I'm doing. Totally okay to do that. You should not feel bad at all. There are smart people Take this opinion, okay? Option two, the restriction was inspired by God as a temporary practice for some wise purpose. God inspired the implementation and the removal of the restriction. What does this mean? The restri restriction was from God. God implements difficult and painful trials for his people. God has different plans for different peoples at different times for his own reasons, okay? Keith Hamilton wrote a book called The Last Labor, Thoughts and Reflections of a Black Mormon. He said, my spirit will not allow me to believe any other position, but that the church's priesthood ban was both instituted and lifted by the Lord, his, his emphasis. Okay, so if you want to believe option two, this is a fine person that also believes in option two. Elder Corbett, Quorum of the 70s says, Master, who did sin, black people? or the early church leaders that the priesthood ban was imposed. I believe that the Savior stood beside us. His answer would be just as forward-looking and glorious as his response to his disciples' question about the blind man. Neither have my black children sinned, nor the prophets, but that the power of God should be made manifest through a miraculous work. So Elder Corbett is option two. And again, you have plenty of good company in option two. <sighs> Brothers and sisters, that's the news. That's all I have to share with you today on this difficult topic. I'm gonna to turn it over to President McConkie to teach us some doctrine. Is that on? Can you hear me? Uh, 
stand up, stretch, wiggle, get some blood circulated. While you're doing that, I want to thank you, Josh. You're a, you're a treasure, really, for your time and your focus and your dedication um, to uncovering this. It's a life pursuit, and we're indebted to you. I appreciate you. Okay. Uh, that's amazing context. And that's, you know, as, as well as you can do in an hour. And, and you would need many, 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 many hours to continue to fill in the blanks, but marvelous, uh, marvelous context. This is a picture of uh, Green Flake. This was a monument that was just put up, really, by Ellis Ivory in our stake, who's uh, the executive director of the This Is The Place Park. And um, this celebrates and memorializes a man who was in the Vanguard Company, uh, the very first wagon that came down Immigration Cannon. Um, so before Brigham, and in fact, Orson Pratt, um, this man came in to the valley, and, and, um, and he's being acknowledged, finally, uh, as representing a, a small fraction uh, but, but the faithful efforts of uh, some, of the, some of the early black saints. Question, do I need to have a testimony of church history to have a testimony of the restored gospel? Quentin Cook says, in learning credible history of the church, we will bind our hearts together with the saints of yesterday and today. We will find examples of imperfect people like you and me who went forward with faith and allowed God to work through them to accomplish his work. I promise that studying the history of the church can deepen your faith and desire to live the gospel more fully. And I subscribe to that. We're taking one sliver of our church history, but by and large, we have an incredibly faith-promoting church history. We ought to say that from the outset. But we also have imperfect individuals. Um, Elder Holland once said, God deals with it and so should you. <laughs> right? We're all he has to work with. Davis Bitten was a PhD at Princeton. He was a professor of history at the U of U. He was also the assistant church historian. And he said some interesting things. He said, I don't have a testimony of the history of the church. When I say I don't have a testimony of the history of the church, I mean that the gospel of Jesus Christ is not subject to scrutiny by the feeble tools of the historian. Let's get one thing clear. There is nothing in church history that leads inevitably to the conclusion that the church is false. There is nothing that requires the conclusions that Joseph Smith was a fraud. He goes on, Admittedly, knowledge of church history is not essential to our eternal salvation, but I do think it's very natural and very satisfying to learn as much as we can. We study history, any history, as part of our human quest for self-understanding. As I read about the Latter-day Saints and their activities in the past as well as the present, I can be inspired, amused, bewildered, Surprised, proud, and sometimes a little ashamed. More often than not, I am amazed at the perseverance, the tenacity, the determination to stay the course through good times and bad. I've given a lot of Temple Recommend interviews. I've never asked the question, do you have a testimony of the history of the church? But I do ask if you believe in the restoration. Brigham Young. I recollect a conversation I had with a priest who was an old friend of ours before I was personally acquainted with the prophet Joseph. I clipped every argument he advanced until at last he came out and began to rail against Joe Smith, saying that he was a mean man, a liar, a money digger, a gambler, a whore master, and he charged him with every bad that he could find language to utter. I said, hold on, Brother Gilmore. Here is the doctrine. Here is the Bible the Book of Mormon, and the revelations that have come through the prophet. I've never seen him. Brigham had never met Joseph Smith at this point. I've never seen him, and I do not know his private character. The doctrine he teaches is all that I know about the matter. Bring anything you can against him. As to anything else, I do not care. If he acts like a devil, he has brought forth a doctrine that will save us. If he will abide it, if we will, 
He may get drunk every day of his life, sleep with his neighbor's wife every night, run horses and gamble. I do not care anything about that, for I never embraced any man in my faith. But the doctrine he has produced will save you and me and the whole world. And if you can find fault with that, find it. It's quite a statement. It's quite a statement from Brigham. Of course, Brigham would go on, to, and we could read all the quotes in the universe about how much Brigham testified of the character of Joseph. He said once that, I know him better than any man living, and I can bear testimony of his character and his morality. George Q. Cannon, do not, brethren, put your trust in man, though he be a bishop, apostle, or president. If you do, they will fail you at some time or place. They will do wrong, or seem to, and have your support be gone. But if we lean on God, he will never fail us. When men and women depend on God alone and trust in him alone, their faith will not be shaken if the highest in the church should step aside. Perhaps it is his own design that the faults and weaknesses should appear in high places in order that his saints may learn to trust in him and not in any other man. So a lot of quotes, and tonight, I'm sorry, but we got a lot of things I'm going to read to you, but I think they're really, really thought-provoking and instructive. Trust in God. Priesthood ban for those of African descent. One of the challenges that a lot of people of African descent have as members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints is this struggle with the history of the church in regards to race and the priesthood. I joined the church at a fairly young age. I was 21. I listened carefully to the missionaries. As uh, they continued to teach me and everything, I was like, this is great. In fact, I've heard a lot of new stuff that I think is exactly right, that makes total sense. And I described it to my friend later. I said, it was kind of like there was this thing whispering to me the whole time, this is what you've been looking for. And of course, later on, I heard about the whole still small voice thing and <laughs> that sort of stuff. Like, oh, I guess that's what was happening while I was taking those discussions. But then you start hearing these sort of rumors almost of like um, blacks not holding the priesthood. So from 1852 to 1978, People of African descent were not allowed to hold the priesthood in the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. When I heard that, I was kind of like, wow, that's a shocker. And I, and I had to kind of think about it in my mind because I, I felt like there has to be some reason for that. I didn't think that I have to just throw the way the whole thing, right? Like what, what good is that gonna do me? <laughs> at this point in time. The other thing I think that you have to do is understand more about it. There's a lot of details that you can learn about once you really get into the history of that. I kind of was praying and I was like, Heavenly Father, I'm really like, why won't you let me hear your voice? Like, I keep hearing this, I keep studying about it, it's all this stuff, I've been baptized, confirmed, etc. Uh, like, am I not good enough? <laughs> you know, and um, and I did. He, he and and he, he was so, he's so amazing. He, he he I did hear his voice, and and he said, very simple, hear me. That's it. And it was the most beautiful, soft, amazing thing. And I thought, okay, is that my imagination, or was that really it? And I said, Heavenly Father, is it really you? Is that really you? And he said, yes, my son. And uh, I don't care what you think about the priesthood. I don't care what you think about dark skin. I know I'm a son of God, and I know he loves me more than I can stand, more than anybody else can stand. So I don't need justification for the past, because again, all I want 
is a personal relationship and everything else is built around that. I wanted to play that video um, because I'm a, we needed a black voice tonight. Josh and I are white. We grew up with every privilege that is afforded to you and I and, this, and you and, you know, and to hear this brother bear his testimony, it was really deeply moving to me. Um, and I think you have to recognize that, acknowledge that, and you can't step into another man or woman's shoes. But um, I, I, I'll, I'll simply say I, I admire greatly the spiritual to tenacity of those who can see past some of the complications of the past and exercise faith uh, in this restored gospel, like this, this good brother. Um, I wanted us to, to reflect on that for a moment. Josh went over this, and so I, I don't want to spend too much time, but maybe to emphasize, there's really sort of two conclusions here. And Josh, again, said that if either one, God revealed and implemented the priesthood restrictions, and he restrained nine successive prophets from lifting it until Spencer W. Kimball in 1978, or God did not reveal the ban. Brigham, Joseph, independently enacted a practice based on a few misapplied scriptures and beliefs, and like the culture of his day, unjustly excluded those of African descent against God's will. God didn't abandon the prophets, but allowed them to struggle until further light was revealed in 1978. Those, those seem to be the two options, right? I say these two conclusions are those for those who believe, those who are exercising faith. Um, option number one, there are questions and implications. Why? Why, God? Why? Well, there's, there's answers that we can surmise and we can debate and that over time have been eliminated. But really, if you accept this conclusion, you have to say, I don't know. I don't know why. It, it's not like plural marriage where you have section 132 where you have a revelation that gives four distinct reasons why the Lord you know, required this law for a season. There is no revelation to point to. Josh read this as well, but this is what is stated on the church website today in the Gospel Essays, right? That the church disavows the theories against the past, that black skin is a sign of divine disfavor, or that it reflects unrighteous actions in a premortal life, Disavows mixed race marriage. But if you believe number two, you also have to ask why. There's a couple of questions that come along with that. Is, we, we do believe in prophetic fallibility. There's a kind of a funny saying that says, in the Catholic tradition, uh, they say the Pope is infallible, but no one believes it. In the Latter-day Saint tradition, we say the prophet is fallible, and no one believes it. <laughs> is there divine allowance in spite of his will? Is there divine silence when we want something else? If you accept this conclusion, you must say, simply, son or daughter, have patience, trust in God, and let's, let's, let's look to the future. I, I would suggest don't do this on the left, do this on the right. And how? How do you do that on the right? Peace and perspective can only come through the Spirit. I appreciate it very much, Stephen, your prayer, where you uh, ask the Lord to send the Spirit tonight. We get peace and perspective by studying God's eternal and scriptural doctrine. And we put faith in definitive revelation. And that's where I want to take you tonight, into what we know about God's doctrine of his love for all of his children. And I want to reflect at, at some length on the revelation that came in 1978. We've done a little of this, Josh, but uh, referring to the priesthood band, McKay said, I have prayed and prayed and prayed but there has been no answer. 
He said this weeping to Marion D. Hanks. Harold B. Lee, shortly before his death, spent three nights in fasting in the upper room of the temple. That shows some measure of earnestness. Praying earnestly on the Lord for guidance on this matter, but the only answer he received was, not yet. Spencer W. Kimball just read the second half. Well, the first part will be in the notes that you can access, but Howard Burton returned from a legal case in Costa Rica to report a successful conclusion. Spencer W. Kimball confided, quote, his concern for giving the priesthood to all men and said that he had been praying about it for 15 years without an answer, but I'm going to keep praying about it. I, I, the, the point of those last three slides is to dramatize that the men who were in the leading councils of the church we're praying earnestly and striving to pull down one scrap of revelation from heaven on this issue. And struggled and struggled. So what is the Lord's doctrine of race and priesthood? There's my grandpa. In March of 1978, President Kimball had been laboring over this topic for some time. And he was bringing it to the Thursday meeting in the temple with the Quorum of the Twelve, and they'd been wrestling about it and talking about it in council. All the Twelve knew that this was weighing heavily on the mind of President Kimball. In March of that year, on March 9th, he asked the brethren in the room, he said, if anyone would like to voluntarily, I invite you to submit any doctrinal rationale that we have for extending the priesthood to all worthy males. On March 10th, just one day later, Grandpa submitted a memo. Um, where he made the doctrinal defense that became the foundation, scripturally speaking, doctrinally speaking, for removing the ban. Um, my understanding, although we don't have access to it, is that uh, Thomas Monson and Boyd Packer also participated in, in volunteering their own. But Grandpa was ready one day later submitted this, and this is not a public record, I'm pulling this from a journal that I have of his. Um, says here on the left, pursuant to your invitation to the members of the 12 to submit comments and suggestions relative to Negroes and the priesthood, I am attaching a document entitled Doctrinal Basis for Conferring the Melchizedek Priesthood upon the Negroes. I'll summarize some of the points of that memo. The gospel and its blessings are for all mankind. He quotes Peter, saying that God's no respecter of persons, but that in every nation he that feareth him and worketh righteousness is accepted. He then went on to quote the third article of faith, which said that uh, all mankind may be saved, in other words, exalted, which would require the ordinances of exaltation. said the salvation of which gained by obedience to the laws and ordinances of the gospel means the gaining of eternal life or exaltation. And then goes on to say that that's available to everybody through the ordinances of the house of the Lord. Another doctrine about God loving uh, all of his children and is the father of all mankind. You remember Acts chapter 10. This is Peter with Cornelius at a time when the gospel was restricted from going to anyone outside of the Jewish or Israelite nation. And Peter struggles over this and receives a revelation where he sees the sheet come down, remember, and the four corners opened and the wild beasts inside and the unclean beasts. And, and the Lord says, don't call unclean that or common that which I have ordained. And now all of a sudden the missionary work goes all to the whole world instead of being restricted at the time. Paul, we've read this tonight, said that God both made 
of one blood all nations. The gospel and all its blessings are to go to all races, nations, and lineages before the second coming. Of the gospel, restored through the prophet Joseph Smith, the Lord taught this many, many times. There's lots of scriptures up there. You can look at that. But let me read one here at the bottom. Go ye into all the world, the Lord said. Preach the gospel to every creature. And in the reference uh, to those individuals, the the revelation continues, to you shall be given power to seal them up unto eternal life. Now, how do you do that, brothers and sisters, without priesthood and sealing blessings? Thus, before the millennium, we must make converts of every kindred and people and nation, and they must progress in spiritual things until they receive the Melchizedek priesthood and the ordinances of the house of the Lord. There's another argument that was made about the fact that every person of every nation and kindred and tongue, many of them could trace their lineage back to Abraham. And there were promises to Abraham through the Abrahamic covenant that Abraham's seed and posterity would bear this ministry and priesthood to the world. Right? That was part of the Abrahamic covenant and promise. Well, let's come to 1978. And this wonderful man, Spencer Kimball. In May... Remember, the revelation came June 1st. In May, this is very interesting. This was new to me. I did not know this. Um, This is LeGrand Richards. He died in 1983 at the age of 96. So in 1978, he's a ripe old man. He says that at the end of a joint meeting with the presidency and the 12 on May 4th, when the priesthood policy was discussed, LeGrand Richard asked permission to make a statement. He then reported, quote, I saw during the meeting a man seated in a chair above the organ, bearded and dressed in white, having the appearance of Wilfred Woodruff. I am not a visionary man, he says. This was not my imagination. It might be that I was privileged to see him because I'm the only one here who had seen President Woodruff in person because he was so old. But LeGrand Richards sees Wilfred Woodruff in the setting where the brethren are talking about the priesthood restriction and ban. We'll come back to what President Kimball said about this in a moment. President Kimball labored over this, as I've alluded, for years and years. He said, on this first Thursday of the month, the first presidency in the 70s, this is June 1st, met in their regularly scheduled monthly temple meeting at 9 a.m., fasting. There they bore testimony, partook of the sacrament, and participated in a prayer circle. The meeting lasted the usual three and a half hours until the conclusion when President Kimball asked the Twelve to remain. President Kimball said, quote, Brethren, I have canceled lunch for today. Would you be willing to remain in the temple with us? I would like you to continue to fast with me. I have been going to the temple almost daily for many weeks now, sometimes for hours, entreating the Lord for a clear answer. I have not been determined in advance what the answer should be. And I will be satisfied with a simple yes or no. But I want to know. Whatever the Lord's decision is, I will defend it to the limits of my strength, even to death. In the words of those who received the revelation, Gordon B. Hinckley said, there was a hallowed and sanctified atmosphere in the room. For me, it felt as if a conduit opened between the heavenly throne and the kneeling, pleading prophet. And by the power of the Holy Ghost, there came to that prophet an assurance that the thing for which he prayed was right, that the time had come. The voice of the Spirit whispered with certainty into our minds and our very souls. It was for us, at least for me personally, as I imagine it was with Enos, who said concerning his remarkable experience, Behold, the voice of the Lord came into my mind. Not one of us who was present on that occasion was ever quite the same thereafter. Elder McConkie said, 
On the day of Pentecost in the Old World, it is recorded that cloven tongues of fire rested upon the people. They were trying to put into words what is impossible to express directly. There are no words to describe the sensation. But simultaneously, the twelve and the three members of the First Presidency had the Holy Ghost descend upon them, and they knew that God had manifested His will. I had had some remarkable spiritual experiences before, particularly in connection to my call as an apostle, but nothing of this magnitude. All the brethren at once knew and felt in their souls what the answer to the importuning peti petition of President Kimball was. Some of the brethren were weeping. All were sober and somewhat overcome. When President Kimball stood up, several of the brethren in turn threw their arms around him. I'll just insert parenthetically that I have 20 pages in my grandfather's journal about this experience. It made a deep spiritual impact on him. Uh, and he talks about this being more powerful than anything he's experienced. I also have record of many marvelous revelations and experiences in his life before this point in time. This was a dramatic revelation. L. Tom Perry, while, we, while he was praying, President Kimball, we had a marvelous experience. We had just a unity of feeling. The nearest I can describe is that it was much like what has been recounted at, as happening at the dedication of the Kirtland Temple. I felt something like the rushing of wind. There was a feeling that came over the whole group. When President Kimball got up, he was visibly relieved. <laughs> I love that image. And overjoyed. Now, we don't need to go through all of these, but you could, you could identify each one of the brethren that were in the room and have them bear testimony. Maybe simply looking at President Benson, he said, he had never experienced anything of such spiritual magnitude and power. Again, this is no spiritual novice. Marvin J. Aston said, the most intense spiritual impression I've ever felt. I just don't think the Lord was mincing inspiration here. This was clear, direct, demonstrable, impactful, legitimate. You put any one of those men on the witness stand, and they can give a resounding testimony that they had received revelation. Back to Wilfred Woodruff. Emotion overflowed as the group lingered. When someone reminded President Kimball of the earlier appearance of Wilfred Woodruff to Lord Grand Richards in the room, Spencer said that he thought it was natural. President Woodruff, quote, would have been very much interested because he went through something of the same sort of experience with the manifesto. Maybe kindred spirits with Spencer W. Kimball. Now, there are many, many statements. There are many, many journals that have been filled. The point of me going in depth to share you with this is to dramatize the reality of that revelation. Now, my counselor, James Nadold, this is, and, and Rebecca, she was involved, produced a son named Charlie. He's over in Uganda. James and Rebecca adopted a sweet boy named Karabo from Uganda. And uh, Charlie got called back there on a mission. Isn't that amazing? And I'm in presidency meeting with President Nadal every Sunday, and, and he pulls up his phone. He says, look at this week. Look at this week. And every week, Charlie's in a picture. These are all him. And there's about 20 more where they're baptizing villages. Um, the Lord is extending mighty miracles to the saints in Africa and beyond. Boy, if I could go on a mission today, you know where, know where I'd want to go? This is the Kirtland of the 1830s. And it's just marvelous what's happening. Functionally and practically speaking, there was a sequencing to how people received the gospel. I've labored among the Chinese saints. And while we've baptized a very small fraction of that people, there are 1.3 or 4 billion people in China who for all practical purposes have been restricted from the gospel.
Well, what conclusions are there, brothers and sisters? I, I, don't, I don't know. I won't even tell you which of the two I believe, because I want you to determine what you believe. But let me tell you what I definitively know. The Lord has guided this people. He's had his hand over the developments of the Restoration. Joseph Smith was a prophet. Brigham Young was a prophet. He got the job done. You want to be critical of Brigham because of the Adam-God theory or you know, this or that? His role was to get the saints out here, to get them established. In the winter, he'd go up the northern spine, or the southern spine. In the summer, he'd go up the northern spine. You know what he'd do? He'd teach them how to irrigate and how to plant and how to fix a wagon wheel, how to harvest cotton down in Dixie. He got the saints established. The Lord had a job for him to do, and he did it. Was he imperfect? Yep. Was Joseph imperfect? Yep. Were they foreordained? Because of their spiritual preparation? Yes. The other thing I know is that this has been a tremendous difficulty and pain for white members of the church and for black members of the church. I do not know all the reasons why. But I think no matter the reason why, there's, there are lessons to be learned. And they all swirl around the concept of love, Patience, waiting upon the Lord, trusting upon the Lord, and sustaining the brethren. The way to peace and perspective on the issue is through an understanding of the Lord's law and doctrine of his love of his children, which is unequivocal. He's a respecter of no person. He loves all of his children. And I believe in putting faith and confidence in the revelation that came. Again, personally speaking, my grandfather went down to the BYU. I say the BYU because my dad used to say that. Uh, and, and, and gave a, a talk where he said, forget anything I've ever said on the subject. The Lord has revealed anew his will. Well, I really, really, really believe in what happened in 1978. I cannot reconstruct the past of what happened before. We've, we've made, uh, uh, frankly, a great effort, and yet it's a meager effort, because what, what tools do we have? But what I have a tremendous amount of confidence is, is that the Lord was involved in that revelation in 1978. And the brethren who witnessed it would bear testimony of that fact to their dying day. Brothers and sisters, uh, our history can be complicated, but our history is beautiful. Our history can be complex and confounding, but our history is inspiring and elevating. I don't have any doubt whatsoever that Joseph was a prophet. I don't have any doubt whatsoever that he holds the keys of this dispensation. Still today, I don't have any doubt that there has been an unbroken line of succession of those apostolic and prophetic keys, and that the Lord has never abandoned his people, and he won't. And I leave that testimony with you in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.